it's all started. Wonderful. Okay, everyone, welcome to another webinar from classroom-expert.com. Today's webinar is brought to you by Dr. Tom McIntyre of BehaviorAdvisor.com, arguably one of the best, if not the best, behavior related sites on the whole world wide web. Certainly my opinion and a lot of others uh, opinions, that's parents and teachers, there's a heck of a lot of information on there. Um, and I know those of you that were around for part one and or, and or have heard the recording of part one will be uh, really, really pleased to, uh, to know that this is part two of the same webinar. So even more strategies for reaching and teaching non-cooperative kids with my good friend, Dr. Tom McIntyre. Okay, before I hand over to him, can I just say that it's really advisable to take as many notes as you can. Fortunately, Dr. Mac doesn't speak quite as fast as I do, and he explains things nice and clearly, so you will be able to take notes as you go along. Feel free to type in questions now, um, but what I will do is I will take questions in the question box, and I will feed them to Dr. Mac as, we, as he goes through his presentation, if they're relevant, uh, or if you're missing something, if, if he's gone too fast on something. So feel free to put questions in the question box, and at the end of the call, uh, if we have time, we will go through some, some questions. I think that's okay, Tom, is it to just go through impromptu questions at the end rather than the planned questions? Sounds like a good time. Cool, cool. Um, Tom and I were, were communicating by email earlier and he's decided that rather than answer questions that were prearranged, we would, well, he would go through some extra content. So he's just going to deliver some brilliant content for you today. Uh, uh, what I will say is that Dr. Mac Tom provides an awful lot of free information on his website. Um, I mean, masses and masses of information. All you've got to do is register at behavioradvisor.com. That's behavior without the U. <laughs> behavioradvisor.com. And once you're registered there, you'll have access to all these tips and resources. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. McIntyre. I'll just get back to this slide so I can introduce you properly, Dr. McIntyre. So strategies for reaching and teaching non-cooperative kids, part two, with Dr. Tom McIntyre from BehaviorAdvisor.com. Over to you, Mr. McIntyre. Thank you so much. Well, welcome everyone to part two of reaching and teaching non-cooperative kids, and thank you sincerely for accommodating our time change. Last time we were together, we covered a great deal of ground. Given that it's been a few months since the previous webinar, please allow me to do a, a quick review. I realize that for some, it may seem a bit repetitive, so, so please excuse me, but I can't help myself. It's a holdover from my many years that I spent as head of my school district's Department of Redundancy Department. When we land on the page in the dictionary for noncompliance, we find this definition, or something similar. Failure to abide by directions and routines. It's a vague, nebulous, undefined explanation that needs to be operationalized. So here goes. An authority figure presents a mand. An attentive student comprehended the command or the request. The student has the skill in his or her behavioral repertoire and the learner failed to comply with the direction within a reasonable period of time and to a reasonable standard. All we need to add in there is the presence of a reasonable teacher. Anytime we intervene, any failure to comply on the part of the student is defiance of some sort. We previously emphasized that it's important to self-check that our professional head is still on our shoulders throughout a behavioral incident. It helps us to avoid engaging in those same tired practices that already didn't work for other teachers and aren't working for us right now. Of course, calm voices didn't work initially either, but to promote pro-social actions in kids who aren't showing an appropriate behavior pattern yet, the cool, collected voices need to be combined this time with effective verbal practices. How we phrase our calm responses is of paramount importance. That was the focus in our final half hour when we talked last time. It's our focus again today. How to use a calm approach effectively. You can be nice 
and be the captain of your classroom at the same time. The verbal strategies that we're going to cover here today combine nicely with just about any practices that you have in place in your educational setting, and they increase the effectiveness of them. They work with humans age three to death. Now, I know that one size fits all. It's a lie in fashion, and it's a lie in education. But perhaps here, today, with these verbal practices, we have one size that fits nearly all spandex strategy, so to speak. Now, in fashion, wearing spandex should be a privilege, not a right. you got to earn it. In education, this approach should be a mandate. Symptom estrangement, separating the behavior from the youth. We previously covered this principle that was first espoused back in the day and is now found embedded in CBT. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Essentially what that's all about is how we size up a situation influences our feelings, which influences then our reactions. I, like many who work with kids who exhibit behaviors that can bring out negative feelings in us, had to remember to hate the behavior, not the kid. To separate the child from the action. The behavior is our target, even though the child holds it. With this mindset and this cognitive framework, we can team up with the youngster against that aberrant behavioral pattern. Battling with our charges is a counterproductive endeavor because with many of our kids, we can't mandate that they comply we can only invite them in. Punishment has failed to modify the kid's pattern of behavior. We know that we work harder for those we admire and respect. The common wrong-headed knee-jerk reaction to non-compliant behavior is oftentimes justified with comments like, you know, it's all they understand. Well then, let's give them a new understanding. I mean, that's what teachers do, right? Well, uh, we use what they know, failing to realize that what they know is what got them to this point in the first place. Realizing that we need sometimes specialized training in how to help these kids behave in a better way. Well, that's online at robsbehavioreneeds.com and visit my site too. There's a lot there to help you work with kids who can be non-cooperative. But with regards to punishment, research tells us that punishment is the wrong approach to handling misbehavior. Any compliance on the youngster's part is not voluntary. Resentment's harbored. Punishment does not teach. We will not teach the youngster a replacement behavior by merely punishing. When we ask why do you keep doing this? The answer is because you haven't taught me what to do in its place. Those who are punished feel bad about themselves and or strike back in your face or behind your back. Remember, it's hard to like a punisher. Punishment prevents and destroys positive relationships. We want to win our youngsters over at the level of the heart by building strong interpersonal relationships. Knowing that it's human nature to work harder for those you like. You've got to like the messenger if you're going to listen to the message. Positive bonds allow us to teach the new behavior, remembering that teaching is more than telling. We can now work with that youngster rather than on that youngster. Once we've got our heads on straight, professionally speaking, we're calm, we use well-phrased commentary, then we can reach through that behavioral barbed wire that's worn by a lot of our non-compliant kids. We can now shake hands rather than strike out with them. 
which analogously speaking leads us to verbal Aikido. Caring and competent teachers, like our martial arts counterparts, defend themselves by throwing their opponent off balance. But we're always concerned with the well-being of that assailant, and we try to avoid injuring him or her. We stand up for ourselves, but we refuse to hurt back. Like our physical counterparts, we use blocks and circular movements. Our mission is to subdue the inappropriate behavior, but not the spirit of the child. We reach out. We do not allow ourselves to be walked over by misdirected student actions. We're forthright, but we're caring. And the result? Positive feelings developed toward each other, and respect is exchanged. When kids are poking at our soft spots, we need to stand back and think, there's a kid in crisis who right now needs a competent, caring adult. Yes, I hate that behavior, but I am going to embrace the child who displays it. Well, how so? When we're defied, we remind ourselves of our role as teacher, mentor, caretaker, interventionist, and we model and teach our verbal displays of respect and assertiveness. The verbal Aikido strategies that we're going to be discussing today defend us, allow us to appear confident and competent. They promote and maintain positive child-adult bonds, teach inner management of behavior, and they're subtle and alluring. Huh? Well, that's A for our Canadian colleagues. Subtlety can be lost on kids who come from homes that use direct communication, households where adults utter straightforward, abrupt commands in a threatening manner, something that we're not supposed to do in the schools and is unbecoming of professionals with the esteemed title of educator which begs the obvious question, if it goes over their heads, how are we going to help them? How are we going to help them get it, so to speak? Kids realize that we attempted to direct them in a supportive manner previous to an official warning or a disciplinary consequence. They see the link there. They see the connection. Oh, that teacher was giving me a nudge, a hint, a cue, trying to work with me. And over time, our subtle ways of phrasing things, our hints, our prompts to the youngster to engage in appropriate behavior. Figuratively speaking, over time, our outstretched hand is then grasped rather than slapped away. The advantages that accumulate with the use of these strategies include an improved ability in students to size up a situation and see their role in it, more behavioral restraint and engagement in pro-social alternatives to the behavior that concerns us, and a brighter future. Here are our interventions, the basic moves in verbal Aikido. Some folks who use more aggressive and assaultive verbal strikes might say, hey, these things are too soft to work with my heart and kids. And due to a lack of coercion, these approaches might be viewed as the educational equivalent of being soft on crime. That's a faulty analogy. We want to avoid using more of what already isn't working. Instead of, if a hammer doesn't work, get a bigger hammer. No, we don't want to get tougher. We want to get smarter. These ideas only appear to be cushy. In actuality, there is an iron hand and a velvet glove. My performance with non-cooperative, defiant, and aggressive kids shot up tremendously in effectiveness when I became privy to them and place them into practice. We'll cover these interventions in order, leaving out the last two for perhaps another time together.